my name is Jemima Birkus. Welcome to yet another edition of the Evening Review. Now, the SADC organ of the Troika summit took place yesterday, and one of the key topics on the agenda was the political unrest in Eswatini, known as Swaziland. We have in studio today a human rights lawyer and political activist, um, Sitelo Gomezulu, and um, Lungizi. Makaya, who will give us an understanding of what exactly is happening in that country. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Now, let's begin with you, Mlungizi. Um, could you give us a brief overview of the current political situation and la political landscape that is uh, that in, in Eswatini? Thank you very much. I think it will be very important that uh, we contextualize giving an understanding of the political landscape in Eswatini. The situation in Swatland, especially since the June-July 2021 massacre, has been extremely tense and volatile, and frankly, outrightly dangerous, as we had seen with the recent assassination of uh, our former Secretary General and the leading human rights lawyer, Comrade Tulan Masebo. But it will be very important to understand the Swazi political situation in context. Mm -hmm. And what do we mean about this is that on 12 April 1973 decree, Five years after um, our independence from colonial British rule, the then king, King Sopoza II, decided to unilaterally set aside the constitution and impose a decree which effectively stripped us as Swazi people effectively of citizenship and rights in our motherland. What did that decree do? It did not only outlaw political activity, dissolved parliament, took all powers, legislative, judicial, and executive powers to the singular hand of the king, but it effectively transferred all ownership of land and minerals, which were at the custodianship of the state, meaning government at the time, to be the personal um, assets of the king. That is the situation that still persist up to today. What is the net effect of that? It simply means that everything that is currently done on Swazi Nation land, in terms of royalties, rents, land and water usages, are not paid to the national coffers. They are paid directly to the personal account of the king, which explains why in a small country with a fairly small population, you have a monarch who is one of the richest leaders in the continent. Sure. That is quite a story. Uh, Sitlelo, can you talk to us about the work you've done alongside the now uh, slain human rights lawyer, Tulani, um, as well as the court case of the members of parliament ongoing? Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, Comrade Tulani, uh, may his soul rest in peace, was uh, one of the leading lights insofar as the struggle for democratic reforms in Swaziland is concerned. Um, many of us have learned from him. He has inspired a generation of activists and we continue to be inspired by his legacy of uh, tolerance, non-violence, negotiation, uh, peace, rule of law, constitutionalism. And so I had, had the privilege of working with him uh, 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 since the members of parliament, the two members of parliament who are my clients, MP Bakrete Mabuza and Mtandeni Tube were arrested on the 20th of July, or should I say on the 25th of July, 2021. We have worked with him in so far as trying to secure bail for the members of parliament and bail has been denied to the members of parliament for more than uh, five times and both of these are business people, they are family men uh, with responsibilities that they have and the reason for that is that uh, the, the judge uh, found consistently that they have flight risk which is something obviously that we deny. So we have worked with the Comrade Tulani in so far as uh, trying to secure bail for them and we have continued to engage with him um, numerous times and his office was still very much actively uh, involved in so far as uh, defending the members of parliament uh, whose trial by the way concluded just yesterday mm -hmm. when we submitted our closing arguments and as things stand we are awaiting a uh, judgment in, uh, in that particular trial. Okay. I want to come back to you, Mlingizi. Um, you talked about the fact, uh, you talked about the, the proceeds for land um, sales and any other activity in the country going directly to the king. Can you take us to the grassroots? How is this impacting the daily lives of 
people of Eswatini? It is impacting us in an extremely negative manner. Again, you would recall that um, we, if you do not have any security of tenure, it simply means that if you are where you are, at the mercy of the chief who is just a footstool of the king. So we have seen evictions where despite generation of in the family having been placed at that particular land because one or two of those kids are involved in political activism, which is offensive, which is regarded offensive by the establishment, then you find an entire family having to be evicted. And in a situation such as ours, where you can litigate against the king, um, it simply means that we do not have a recourse, which explains why a number of our people are very skeptical about joining, joining political activism because it can have a serious negative impact to the entire array of their lives in terms of land, security, in terms of access to scholarship and a variety of other things. So most of the land where we've built our homes, it falls under the Swazi Nation land, which is effectively land owned and controlled by the king, supposedly um, as in, on behalf of, uh, of the nation. Uh, it, it's a very confusing situation if you are from outside. But for us, it's a daily nightmare as, as the people of Swaziland. Sure, that is quite a story. Um, I, w um, I would like to talk to you um, on the, you are banned in Eswatini. How is that impacting your life and your work S since you are representing people in Eswatini itself? It's a ridiculous state of affairs if you ask me. Um, I was born in Swaziland. Uh, my mother is a Swazi, my father is a South African. I grew up in Swaziland, did my primary education, high school education, university education in Swaziland. And I employ a lot of Swazis uh, even now as we speak. Um, but simply because of the posture that I took, uh, especially after the massacre, a posture that says there has to be reforms in Swaziland which will usher in a new democratic dispensation where the people will have the right to choose the government of their choice and, and where the, the, the government that is elected will be responsible for the coffers and the fiscus of the nation. It's the posture that I took. I aligned myself deliberately with the cause for the mass democratic movement in Swaziland and I've been very vocal in that particular regard. I suppose then the powers that be, perhaps even the king in particular, didn't like the posture that I took coming into Swaziland to represent the MPs as a South African and yet making these pronouncements. But I had to make these pronouncements because I am alive to the lived reality of many Swazis, which the president has so correctly summarized. And um, I think it was my conscience wouldn't allow me just to walk into Swaziland, represent my clients and then walk back without calling out the, the injustice, which is very blatant, which was happening right before my eyes every day after court when I had to address uh, the protesters who would have come to support the, the members of parliament. Many of them were brutalized. Uh, many of them were shot right in front of me. And each time that they had to go to hospital, you would find that there is no medication, even a basic thing like a painkiller or a bandage, they wouldn't have it. Now, faced with a situation like that, there was no way that I couldn't call out such things. And I think that's the sort of rhetoric that didn't sit well with the, with the powers that be, which is why on the 1st of September then, 2022, a, a, a national or government gazette was issued against me, and then I became effectively banned from Swaziland. But we have taken that matter to court. Uh, don't ask me if I've got confidence in the court system, but <laughs> nevertheless, we have done that. So we, 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 we will we'll see it played out in court and then let's see where it takes us. But I think what would make me even more satisfied it is to secure a political settlement for the upheavals in Swaziland, which will result in the unbanning of political parties, which will result in exiles coming back into the country because many of the leaders find themselves now in exile because of threatened arrests, harassment, and um, overt acts of violence against them and their families. So if we are to secure a political settlement, that will make me happier than some selective justice that one might get uh, uh, simply because I've brought this case to, to the Swazi courts. But it has, uh, maybe just lastly, but what, what it has done is that it has made it difficult for me as an attorney 
uh, who is in South Africa, uh, operating from South Africa to consult effectively with my clients, to be instructed by them, and, um, and also to, to better prosecute their defense. So we find ourselves in a situation where we have not been able to, to interact as, as, as an attorney and client should. Mm -hmm. um, I want to come back to you since you spoke about confidence. Um, you traveled to Namibia to, meet, uh, to be here as, as, um, as the Troika to place. Do you have faith in SADC to help you to um, overcome these obstacles? Do you so what is it that you need from the region to actually see um, the emergence or the arrival of multi-party democracy if there are these many um, obstacles in your way right now? Well, we, we came here because we feel it is very important and frankly quite urgent for SADAC to pay particular attention on the issue of Swaziland. We think that um, SADAC has allowed Swaziland to sort of stay away from the limelight despite the fact that Swaziland has been violating most of the accrued principal guidelines and protocols of SADAC. But also because we think that um, if we want to find a long-lasting resolution to the Swazi problem. SADAC definitely has a role to play, and a big role to play Absolutely. for that matter as a regional body. Uh, but Namibia becomes of special interest to us because of the renewed impetus and energy and interest that we have seen since Namibia assumed the chairpersonship of the organ on Troika. Of course, the South African uh, president laid the basis in the sense that he went there, fact-finding machine, special envoys, and um, compiled a preliminary report that were presented in the last summit of SADAC that mandated uh, the Namibian president, president to take the process through. But since he assumed that role, we have quite been satisfied at what we believe um, are efforts. And uh, I think he has not minced the words in terms of trying to nudge King Mswati to say, you are not going to find peace if you do not speak to those that you do not like, mm -hmm. which I think explains why uh, King Mswati was conspicuously absent in this uh, summit. He has that tendency, by the way, that when he's going to be called to account, he then decides to send the prime minister. And the problem we have, particularly with sending a prime minister in the Swazi situation, is that the prime minister has no power in Swaziland. Uh, I always say he's equivalent to a statue because engaging a prime minister in Swaziland, frankly, is a waste of time. Because when you speak to them, they always tell you that they need to refer to Labatsa Allah, meaning the elders. And we know every Swazi will tell you when uh, they say Labatsa Allah or the elders, who are they referring to? So we feel that uh, it would have been very prudent that uh, the SADA communique and message would have been given directly and in the presence of the person who is the principal source of the Swazi's nightmare. Thank you for saying that. We'll go for a quick uh, break and then we'll, I'm coming back to you, Ziklilo. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome back. Um, we are having a uh, human rights lawyer and uh, political activist in studio with us today who's talking about the situation in Eswatini. Uh, before we went for a, br a break, Zikrelo, uh, Mnungizi, um, uh, we're talking about um, the situation in Eswatini and the fact that they have faith in SADC as an organ. Um, as a human rights lawyer, as someone with, a, uh, with the interest of the Eswatini people um, uh, at heart, what is it that you would like to see? Yesterday, one of the speakers at the press conference said they no longer want to see fact-finding missions. They don't want to see uh, peace missions. What exactly is it that you would like to see taking place um, to help the Eswatini uh, reign in a new era of democracy? 
Well, I, I think what is key is for SADAC to be at all material times be mindful of its own protocols and commitments that are made by the respective uh, leaders or countries which constitute uh, SADAC as a bloc. And, and one of the things um, taking over from uh, the, the work that uh, President Ramaphosa of South Africa did when he was chairperson of the SADAC Troika on security is that uh, he secured a commitment from King Mswati to convene a, a national dialogue. Uh, and that was uh, almost 18 months ago. And we, we take the view that had that dialogue taken place, had that commitment been made, many of the ills that we have witnessed, especially in the past year, where there has been a spike in violence, uh, killings, and uh, reprisals against the political activists, many of that would not have been seen. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we would be sitting here um, knowing that uh, Comrade Tulan Mase would have been alive because uh, he was one of the activists who was actually championing that engagement with Sadak, which secured the commitment from the king that there will be a dialogue. Um, but uh, fast forward to today, there has not been a dialogue. And yet again, later on last year, it must have been some time in November, there was another commitment again that there will be a dialogue. In fact, last year, in the financial year of last year, the Swaziland government even set aside a budget of about 22 or 28 million rands, I'm speaking under correction, which, or a malangan in their currency, which was going to fund the dialogue exercise. But uh, we are already at the end of the financial year, and there has not been any movement towards that. I think coming back to your question, what we would see is that we would like to see a situation where uh, SADAC as a forum or as a body is able to hold its own member states to account, but also to honor their commitments. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Swaziland, the commitment that we expect must be honored is the commitment to an all-inclusive national dialogue, which will uh, work towards resolving the, the impasse. Now, the argument of the state in Swaziland, as uh, many uh, Swazis would know, is that there cannot be a, a, the state cannot dialogue with terrorists. Now, but nobody has been found guilty of terrorism. Not even my clients who are in jail have been found guilty of terrorism. But uh, the government will easily brand uh, people like the activists, like uh, uh, the president of Putemo as a terrorist without them having been found guilty of anything. And then the government will say, we are not going to, to negotiate with terrorists. Uh, and yet the same government is able to go ahead with, with its own functions, with all with own cultural activities, where thousands of people are assembled. And they bring in what we call mercenaries. They call them security specialists to come and maim and kill our people, but to secure and also to secure their own events. Now, our argument is that if they are able to hold those events where thousands of people converge, in the same vein, they can be able to hold an all-inclusive dialogue which is aimed at resolving the current impasse in that country. And so what, what, what we would expect, maybe I will take a slight view, we, we've got no problems at all with the SADAC and international partners taking an interest into what is going on in Swaziland uh, by sending people to find facts, to unearth the facts and try to understand the situation as it obtains on the ground. In fact, we welcome that. In fact, the more partners, the more international players take interest in the situation in Swaziland, the better for us because it assists us in terms of profiling the struggle in Swaziland and putting it into the right context, mm -hmm. which is a very simple matter, by the way. Uh, what we are faced with in Swaziland is a king who insists on his right to govern and to rule over a people, even when those people are now saying we want a situation where we can govern themselves. Swaziland remain an island in, in the whole of uh, uh, Sadak, an island of dictatorship in a sea of democracies. And we think that situation is untenable. It is about time that the, so the, the people of Swaziland are able to elect a government of their choice, a government that is uh, answerable to them, because the current government is not answerable to the people. It is for that reason that the submission of petitions was to the members of parliament or the so-called members of parliament was banned in 2021 
and uh, which then resulted in the in the killing of many many people for the simple reason that you have got a government that is unresponsive to the needs of the people one but secondly that is not accountable to the people mm -hmm. and we think a situation like that needs to be arrested we need to reframe the constitutional order in Swaziland such that the power rests with the people in the true sense of the word. A government is answerable to the people in the true sense of the word. And of course, we would appreciate a situation where the monarchy stays out of politics, just like as it is the case now in mm -hmm. Lesotho. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be too difficult a matter, really. Um, in conclusion, um, Lungizi, can you just tell us, how do you, what do you think, how far have you come in pushing for a multi-party democracy? And looking at all these obstacles, how, uh, how long do you think would it take to, for this to actually realize? Well, it is unfortunate that it has taken this long. The struggle for multi-party democracy in our country can be traced back even before um, our independence from Britain, where Swazis had constituted themselves in different political parties, and they, those political parties played a significant role in ensuring that we ultimately get uh, to self-govern ourselves from British colonial rule. And as I said, what 1973 decree did is just, it took us back to that dark era. But what we think we need to do is to have these SADA countries, um, particularly when one wants to make a plea to Namibia because we're in Namibia here, that there's definitely going to be an increase in the number of sources who will be forced to flee their country as the state is continuing to intensify the violence and attack and killings. And Namibia and Namibians should be able to grant some of those comrades political asylum because we are extremely concerned about the safety of activists. We don't want to lose any other more leaders. We think that the loss of Tulane the loss of Comrade Mema, and the loss of many other activists who are less known um, has been too massive a loss. And um, one of the clients of uh, Mgome Zuluye on today's newspaper in Swaziland was making the point that they attempted to kill him before he was arrested, um, MP Batret. So we know that the state's first choice is to eliminate us. Where it cannot eliminate you is to try and push you to exile because then they will know that it's difficult to mobilize from outside. But we are confident that with the support of the people of the region, the people of the continent, and the people of the world, and principally through our own efforts as Swazis, uh, freedom is going to be visit our shores very soon rather than later. Th thank you very much for joining us for this uh, insightful conversation. Thank, thank you, you so for much. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Until next time. In Business 7, you get news on current economic, financial, and business matters in Namibia. The weekly show features interviews with experts and in-depth analysis of burning issues in a way that caters for ordinary Namibians and business connoisseurs alike. We crunch the numbers that matter, decipher statistics that shape Namibian lives, discuss smart money, and explore the impact of global development locally. Money makes the world go round, so catch us on NTV, 1up2.com, and the Facebook platforms of the Namibian Sun, Republican, Algomina Taitung, and Namibia Media Holdings. For news related or advertising queries, please contact v7 at synergy.com.na.